Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is prepared for the second quarter or the months of April, May, and June of 2014. This particular series is entitled Christ and His Law, and this is Lesson 3 in that series entitled Christ and Religious Tradition. Do we have religious traditions? Is that a good idea? What, 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 what is the authority between a, behind a religious tradition? And a lot of background material um, I put together in the handout which we use in our discussions. If you're interested in getting that handout, you could go to our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Might give you some ideas of things to ask about and talk about in your own Sabbath School class. I hope you have your Bible in your hand now, and we'll have a prayer as we begin our study together. Our loving Father, as we look back to the time when you lived here on this earth, and you moved back and forth among people with prejudices and all sorts of bizarre ideas about what you were supposed to be and do, help us to weave a straight line, to follow a straight line through all these traditions and so forth, so that we may understand where they came from, why they were there, and what validity they might or might not have. We thank you for being so clear in your own thinking that you could weave your way through all these man-made rules. Now help us to follow your example and all that we, as far as we can is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I suppose really the question I need to ask today is, should tradition play a role or should it not play any role in our religious practice? Define what tradition is. That's, of course, the first question. The Greek word in the New Testament for tradition is simply that which is handed down. <coughs> what did you learn from your parents? What did you learn from the pastor? It's what's handed down to you. Okay, these, this is the way we do things. Now, the Bible, scriptures have been handed down, mm -hmm. so how does that um, switch? How well, does that differentiate? Uh, well, okay, <coughs> but the, the Bible has the additional, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, authority that is the Word of God. It's very different. Tradition means the things that we do, we don't have anything directly in the Bible for it. It means these are the things we do because this is the way we've chosen to do it. <coughs> <clears throat> Could a tradition be like the order of the worship service? That's a good example of tradition. And another tradition that is very almost sacred among Adventists is the communion, which we do once a quarter. And a lot of churches used to do that, but many churches have moved away from, especially the foot washing part, uh, and have modified the way they do the, the rest of it. Um, so it's quite different. Uh, there are not many churches left that follow the exact uh, example of Jesus in the upper room. Mm. Well, John Wesley founded the Methodist Church. He suggested that one's theology was influenced by four factors, <laughs> faith, reason, scripture, and tradition. What do you think should be the role of each of these factors in our religion? Faith reason, <coughs> scripture, and tradition. What's, how are those well, related? Why would he stick tradition in? Does well, because it, 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 it's a pretty major, I mean, in Catholic times, it was a huge, I mean, in the Middle, in the middle Ages, it was a huge factor in how religious services were conducted. Uh, we're, speaking, we're speaking of it almost here to begin with, as if there's something wrong with tradition. A lot of people think so. Protestants people think of, think so. Well, I think probably one of the main risks, <coughs> if not the main risk, <coughs> first up, humanity's passing it down, so there's a chance for something to get messed up there. But interpretations of Scripture can be over generations twisted or changed. There's, mm -hmm. there's no real reliability that you can totally trust on. Mm -hmm. That's the big problem. The 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 first three things, faith, reason, and scripture, that's all um, in a way kind of ethereal. 
Tradition is actually the works. Mm -hmm. That's where you're actually doing stuff. Largely, yes. Certain, <laughs> but not always. There are beliefs we have which are traditions also. He seems to put them in a line. Faith, reason, scripture, tradition. Shouldn't it be scripture and from that comes faith, um, reason, and tradition? Always putting scripture at the top and yeah. not lining them up in yeah. equality? That should be. But uh, the only problem with that is that not everybody's had scripture. Mm -hmm. through history. Well, you gotta so look. then, what do you do there? You've got to look a little bit at John Wesley's background. England had been through rampant Catholicism as it was mm -hmm. practiced those days, and Henry VIII broke away, and then we had what we call Church of England, uh, and, and one, you know, there's one or two other names. Mm -hmm. There was a well-established tradition. All of these offshoots came out of that. <laughs> well, how did, how did we get our traditions? Is that we, need, we need to be honest with that. Where did our traditions come from? I have a question. Are traditions unwritten laws or are traditions man-made laws? Or, I mean, are traditions, what do you call, uh, written down or are they not okay. written down? The, the Greek New Testament word for traditions is paradidomi. It's interestingly the same word that talks about Christ being handed over on the cross. He died because he was handed over. Um, traditions are what is handed down from one generation to another. Okay, this is the way we do it. We all go to, we go to church on Sabbath morning. We do this, we do that. Those are traditions. Or this is how I can my peaches. <coughs> yeah. Daughter, this is, and you teach your daughter and... And there's several reasons why traditions are important. Can you think of a reason why a tradition would be important? Well, um... It's good to have uh, habits are good. Yes. Not all habits are bad. There okay. are good habits, and habits are a traditional thing. I get up every morning, and mm -hmm. it's my habit to brush my teeth. It's my tradition to brush my teeth. You don't have to think and yeah. plan everything. It's just kind of gears, the, autom the automatic gears put into place. New <coughs> neurophysiologists who study the brain and how it works tell us that your brain has a certain amount of, of, and I won't go into the technical details, but a certain amount of capacity to think and make decisions each day. You only have a certain amount. If you had to, every morning when you got up, you had to figure out how to get out of bed, how to put on your clothes, how to brush your teeth, how to eat your food. Which foot to put in front of the, each yeah, foot. Which, which sock to put on which foot, which shoe to put on which foot. You would be completely tired by the time you got done, before you got to work. You would, you would have used up all your brain power. That's so, called retirement. You, you, you <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like old age. That's good. Not that bad yet. <laughs> so many decisions. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, we need, if, by having traditions, we do things a certain way. We don't have to think about them. But that's, that's a bit of a hazard because if you start doing something wrong and it becomes a habit and you don't have to think about it, you just keep doing what's wrong. Well, so I come back here. Yeah. Often the reason you continue to do it is you don't want to have to think about it. Yes. You don't want to. Yes. You're okay, avoiding. Back, back to how we Adventists got our traditions. Now, what traditions are you talking about? Here? I'm, 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 I'm trying to avoid that part of the question so far. <laughs> we'll come to that part later. How do we get our traditions? Where do they come from? Well, it's similar to what I, it's an offshoot of what I just mentioned earlier. When the pilgrims got here, they were used to traditions. Mm -hmm. And then later on, we had what we as Adventists call the Great Awakening. But mm -hmm. out of those earlier traditions that came, that's where it started. Well, well some, some traditions are, are put in to um, provide a, a, a foundation for uh, what you're trying to accomplish. For example, in, in many Adventist churches, Sabbath school, you will have a secretary who gives a secretary's report. You will have a mission. It's been a long time my Sabbath school doesn't do this. but um, And the reason for that is, is um, there's a lot of small churches. And so this has been a system prepared whereby um, they have some kind of a, of a plan for their small church 
for their small church. Mm -hmm. They may have some churches, maybe, maybe what are they called, branches? Yes. They only have uh, maybe five or ten members. And you get up and have this whole system and think it up all the time and so forth. There's a, there's a bit of a program to help you to help you through. Okay. And so this is, this is kind of a tradition in many Adventist churches. How many of you have heard about the Sabbath conferences in early <coughs> Adventism? I, I've heard about those. What happened there? Also Bible conferences. Yes. <coughs> what happened in those places? A group of, a group of young people, mostly young people, some of them were teenagers, mm -hmm. after the great disappointment in 1844, said the time has come for us to sit down and they, they had to work hard all week long. So they came together on the Sabbath. They were determined to keep the Sabbath. They knew that, they felt that was right. And they sat down and they studied this. They studied the scriptures in the spare time they had during the week. And then they came together and they just hammered out what they believed, battling with each other with the scriptures open in front of them, sometimes all night long. Sometimes Ellen Wright would have to go in and say, I think we're getting more heat than light here. It's time for people to go to bed. But that's how our traditions came about. They were, in fact, and let me give you an example. At, in the very early days, Seventh-day Adventists were keeping Sabbath not from sundown to sundown, but from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. because they thought maybe that's what God wanted. And later they said, no, even to even means from sundown to sundown, and so we started doing it from sundown to sundown. So, this is a tradition. It's not necessarily a biblical mandate. We could do the 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. thing if we thought that was... Uh, well, but the question... Especially if we lived in Alaska. You define what you <laughs> yeah, Especially if you live in Alaska in the middle of the... Well, you never see the sun all day long. Yeah. Um, so let's think about that now. Um, how did they decide that it was supposed to be from sundown to sundown? They read the scriptures with an open mind... Mm -hmm. just like we should do, not take anything for granted and exactly. have an open mind and see what the words say. Unfortunately, far too many of us have, and remember, what did, what did John Wesley say? Our ideas of religion are supposed to be based on Scripture. Reason. Reason. Faith. Faith. Tradition. Tradition. Okay, what's happened? We would rather let someone else do the thinking for us. And we make excuses, well, surely those pastors, surely the general conference leaders, they know the Bible better than we do, right? So we let someone else do our thinking for us. Is that a good idea? Yeah. You're going to, people listening to you are going to start studying this, list, watching this broadcast, are going to listen to what you're proposing here. They're all going to get off in their own little groups, and we're going to have a bunch of factions in the church because they've all if they departed are, from what the brethren have. If they are studying the Bible the way the brethren studied the Bible, there won't be any problem. Well, would you follow a blind man as he goes off a cliff into a mud puddle or something? You know, you're supposed to think for yourself and not just yeah. follow. I, I, I remember hearing a story about the blind man that was standing on a corner for a long time waiting for someone helping him to go across the street. And finally someone came up and took his hand and they walked across the street. And then the other guy says, thank you for helping me across the street. I'm blind. <laughs> I mean, do we want to be like that? We want to be crossing the street and two blind people think we're helping each other across the street? Number one, it's hard to think. Number two, it takes time. Yes. And number three, you might reach a conclusion that is different than everybody else, and then, uh-oh, you're different. Yeah. Is there, is there any possibility that we could be maybe drifting away a little bit from... That's the problem with tradition, isn't it? Large tradition tends to drift. Well, how do you know when you're drifting? Well, that, and that's the question. How do you know when you're drifting? Well, there were some people who said that those folks who have decided to do sundown to sundown, they're drifting away. They ought to be doing the 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. <laughs> yeah, except that the sundown to sundown is what the Bible says. Yes. Well, I know, but man, you know, I taught at a <laughs> Inconvenient, school. Inconvenient, right? I taught at, the, at, a, at a boarding school. It was at the far western end of the time zone. Mm -hmm. And... Sundown on Friday night in the summertime came about 9 p.m. And then 
<coughs> on Saturday evening it came about 9 p.m. And I will tell you, being a, a boy's dean in a dormitory, yes. waiting for sun to come down at 9 p.m. on a Saturday, I kind of was sided with the people that wanted to go with a 6 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I can understand that. I can understand that. But you can kind of look at this if, if you believe from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., you know, that's the cutoff time, and you've <laughs> actually had your family do that for many generations, mm -hmm. and then somebody all of a sudden comes up and shows us in the Bible, oh, sundown to sundown. Um, I think that's where the tradition and the, the yep. other thing that we're trying to define kind of a collide right here. Yep. So I'm, I'm still trying to define what that is. Yeah. Well, so we maybe, don't, oh, go ahead. Maybe the problem was, and is, um, that uh, we were waiting for, for Saturday night to come after 9 o'clock. Maybe the problem was, was what we were doing before 9 o'clock. Maybe there, maybe our traditions of what we can do um, before the sundown comes. Maybe those traditions are need to be um, yeah. revised. I have no suggestions for that, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now let's think about the children of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, at the foot of Mount Sinai, they were given not only the Ten Commandments, but what else were they given? The writings of Moses. Five books of interesting stories and traditions. About 500 years later, David said, okay, we've come to the place now where it's time for us to build a temple. He collected a lot of money. Most of it, a lot of it was his own, but he collected a lot of money in taxes as well. Set it aside. Solomon built the temple. And what happened? You mean the temple was Most, built? Huh? Oh. The temple was built and basically much of their, almost all of their religious tra tradition was around. Now, we as people in the 21st century look back and say, well, what about the synagogues? There weren't any synagogues till almost the days of Jesus. Only there one was temple? Only one temple, and that was at Jerusalem. That doesn't sound like very good planning. It doesn't, does it? Well, Levites were scattered around the country. <laughs> Well, but people could have, you know, every man was a priest of his own home. Yes, that was what's supposed to happen. The Levites. So, so you know, there was daily morning worship uh, time and maybe Most evening time and, and whatever they wanted to do. Right. So it wasn't necessarily you had to get to the temple to. And there was the fertility cult religion right down the street. There's well, but you convert them. You're supposed, to, you're supposed now, to convert them. Yeah, are the course. Levites, the, uh, they're supposed to be the pastors and the preachers? Yeah. yeah. And so they were scattered in the country. They weren't there all... There were 48 cities of refuge scattered around, Levite cities around the country, scattered all through the country where the Levites sit. Well, Actually, if, there were 12 cities of refuge, but there were 48 other cities scattered around that were supposed to be Center, they were supposed to be centers for religious instruction and so forth. So wherever a Levite was, there was a little school or little uh, religious well, no. uh, building? That probably what was supposed to happen, but that's not what happened. Okay. Would they just live in their house? Yeah. But they were supposed to be a religious teacher. If you, if you want to get into details, um, we don't want to talk about them right now. No, Read the last three chapters of Judges and you'll get an idea what happened. <laughs> so they were scattered around the country, but the Jews came to believe that this temple that God had designed and given Solomon instructions for it was so sacred to God that God would never let anything happen to it. Remember what they said about the time Nebuchadnezzar showed up to attack Jerusalem? God would Jeremiah 7, first three verses, The Lord sent me to the gate of the temple where the people of Judah went in to worship. He told me to stand there and announce what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, had to say to them. Change your way. You are living in the things you are, the way you're living and the things you are doing, and I will let you go on living here. Stop believing those deceitful words. We are safe. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. And they thought, hey, if, we're, if we stay close to this temple, this is God's house. There's no way that he's going to let anything happen to them, to it. Were they yeah. using it like a giant rabbit's foot? Yeah. Well, but in a way, 
had they, quote, stayed close to the temple as they were supposed to, mm -hmm. nothing would have happened to them, just like yeah. if we stay close to God today. Well, staying close to God is one thing. Staying close to a physical structure is something else. Well, I, I know that I meant quotes <laughs> close. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, the temple was destroyed. And when the children of Israel came back from mm -hmm. Babylonian captivity, only maybe 1% of them came back and they tried to build another temple, which they finally succeeded with under, um, under Haggai and Zechariah. And Ezra came along somewhat 40, 50 years later and, and tried to encourage them to get together. And they still didn't even have walls around their city. And it was a pretty sorry mess. It really was a pretty, all their enemies were around them. You know, God's people have all sorts of disappointments. There was the flood. And like, why is God doing this? The temple that gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus gets crucified. And then the great disappointment, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's, what are we supposed to learn from all this? Well, Ezra realized when he came back from Babylonian captivity that we've got to do something to give these people something to look to, something to give them hope. And so he started getting all, to gathering together all the pieces of scripture that people had either memorized or had, had preserved. And he put together the first version of what might be a bit of a Bible. Of course, it was only Old Testament in those days. And then he set up a school and he taught people how to copy the Bible very carefully. And eventually they, they, they developed a, a series of of people, a group of, of scholars who, who read the Bible and understood it and could, could interpret it for the, for, the, for the general population. Now remember, when they came back from Babylonian captivity, what language were they speaking? Aramaic. And what language were they writing? Obviously Aramaic. Now Aramaic is, is fairly close to Hebrew, but it wasn't Hebrew. So the Bible had all the Old Testament now, almost all of it, not quite all of it, but there's a few, a few parts that needed to be written. But the Bible was written in Hebrew, and just a few little sections in Aramaic. So what do you do now? You have a Bible that's written in a different language. So did he have to train the people in Hebrew and, and, and then get them organized to copy it? And what he did is very interesting. Look at Nehemiah 8. Um, Ezra was standing on a wooden platform that had been, I'm reading from verse 4, what had been built for the occasion. He called all the people in. He said, we need to know what God's word says. He, he brought all the people in for this special occasion. The following men stood at his right, and he gives their names, and the others stood at his left. As Ezra there on the platform, high above the people, they all kept their eyes fixed on him. As soon as he opened the book, they all stood up. Ezra said, praise the Lord, the great God. All the people raised their arms in the air and answered, amen, amen. They knelt to worship with their faces to the ground. Then they rose and stood in their places, and the following Levites explained the law to them. And so what happens? What was going on? Well, they gave an, these men that were standing by Ezra, I'm sure Ezra gave his information in Hebrew, and then it says, verse 8, these men gave an oral translation of God's law and explained it so that the people could understand it. Okay, so that tells us something. What kind of people were those? Uh, the ones saying the law or the ones mm -hmm. hearing it? The ones saying it, translating it, and, and giving it, explaining it to people. They were bilingual. Uh, scribes. They were scribes. They came to be known as the scribes. These were the scholars, okay? And a, a group of the very most notable scholars down through the, the generations started giving interpretations of the Bible that would help people to understand. And that group of very noted scholars came to be known Oh, down through the generations as the great synagogue. Now when you talk about explaining the Bible, are you talking about translation from Hebrew to Aramaic, or are you talking about um, Inter interpretation? All of the above. All of the above. Yeah. Now by great synagogue, you're not talking about a big building. No. It's called these, the, the collection of these people. These were a collection of people who, who <coughs> interpreted the Bible. This is, what, this is what we should learn from these scriptures that God has given us. So the scribes together as a group formed the great synagogue? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the great synagogue were, were special ones of those. The very best of the, of the scribes. Best came of to the be, best. Oh, down through the generations came to be known as the great synagogue. 
But then something very unusual and very upsetting to some people happened. What happened when Alexander the Great conquered the world? Just that, he got, went through Israel. He, he went every, through Israel and? Covered everywhere, down into Egypt. Yeah. East, yeah, yeah. And what was his idea about what should happen? You were nothing unless you were Greek traditions, Greek language, Greek, Greek, culture, Greek. Culture, culture. His, Alexander's idea was that when he conquered the world, everyone was, become, was to become Greek. They were supposed to be Greek speaking, they were supposed to be Greek culture, their cities were supposed to rebuilt, be, re, be rebuilt according to Greek, stru, Greek cu customs and uh, structures and so forth like this. Everything was supposed to be redone. Utopia. And what, huh? Utopia. Yeah. And what was the result? Well, for, for quite a while, the Jews were so stubborn about keeping their religion, albeit not always very well, their tradition. That they, their tradition, that they were left alone. But finally, this madman, Antiochus the Four Epiphanes, came along and said, okay, we've had enough of this. It's time for you Jews to adopt Greek culture and Greek religion. And he came in, he offered pigs on the altar in, in the t temple in Jerusalem. He set up a great statue of Apollo in the courtyard and so forth like this. And he says, from now on, you're going to worship, you're going to become Greek and you're going to worship Greek gods and so forth. And what was the result? The Maccabean Rebellion. About three and a half years later, the Maccabean family rose up and over a number of years, uh, over another three or four years, they managed to... Uh, to chase the, 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 the Greek people out. And, um, so first the Greeks overpowered the Jews mm -hmm. and then the Jews, through this strong family of seven boys or whatever, drove the Greeks back? Yeah, um, of course they, 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 they conducted a kind of guerrilla warfare. Yeah. So it was a slow process. Over three and a half years, more or less, they finally dro drove the Greeks out and reestablished the, the Jewish worship in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. Was the Bible translated into Greek during this time, or did, no. so well, it was? Well, probably the first books were. We don't know for sure. Okay, uh, but the, the, okay, the Bibles remained. Yes, okay. Scrolls. Scrolls. So, the, during that time, the pious, there was a pious Jewish sect known as the Hasidim. What does Hasidim mean? The righteous ones, okay. The, they were very strongly opposed to this Greek idea, Greek cultures. They said, "We are Jews. We, we have to follow our Greek. I mean, our, our Jewish customs, and our religion." And as far as it's, we're able to determine at this point in history, the Pharisees were the were the result of those Hasidim. They were the ones, the remnant of the Hasidim. By contrast, what do we know, what do we know about the Sadducees? They were kind of a ruling class. They were a kind of ruling class. They had more money. How did they get their money? They usually Temple get tax. it by buying and selling. Trading. They controlled the commerce inside the temple. That, that uh, market, if you want to call it there, that Jesus disrupted twice during his lifetime, that was, that was the business that the Sadducees used to make all their money. And then they bought the privilege of being high priest from the Romans every year. They literally bought the privilege of being the high priest. So they weren't named the high priest through the Bible? Mm -mm. No, wow. not at all. Well, that was the difference between the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans conquered you but allowed you to keep your religion or whatever as long as you didn't step the, over the line. And they, yeah. they had to pay a cross to the, Ro who, the Roman garrison or whatever, the citadel or something mm -hmm. was there. Did yeah. they try and get a Levite in there whenever they could? Yeah. Just to make it kosher. Yeah. Now, in Jesus' time, were the Sadducees still paying for their um, leadership role? Were they yeah. still? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, and how he got it was buying it. Wow. Yeah. Of course, now, wasn't that all, all the only thing it required was you had to be a Levite? Well, what was supposed to happen is the high priest was supposed to be a direct descendant of Aaron. Yeah. Mm. And that's what was supposed to happen. He was supposed to be the most righteous person around. He was supposed to be following all the, the rules and so forth. But remember, at this point in time, the temple no longer has the ark in it. There's just a rock in the most holy place. 
So when Jesus set up that a Levite was supposed to be, the Sadducees kind of just elbowed their way in and said, uh, we're going to be in this honored position. Well, they, the Sadducees, remember, didn't believe that there's anything beyond this life. So their idea was, get what you can while you're here. And they were ready. They, didn't, they really didn't care. They said, if the Greeks say that's what we've got to do, go with the Greeks. If they're helping us, we'll work with the Greeks. When the Romans came along, okay, let's cooperate with the Romans. That, that's the way the Sadducees did it. So they came from the, the Maccabee line, you think? The Sadducees? Yeah. Some of them did. Some of them. I don't know how many. That's all. probably why they got their foot in the door in the yeah. first place, because it wasn't there anymore anyway. So. Yeah. And the Essenes. What do we know about the Essenes? I thought the Pharisees were a kind of a loose crowd. <laughs> so the Pharisees thought the Sadducees were very, very loose, and the Essenes were way out to the other side. They thought even the Pharisees were way too... They thought what was going on in the temple had gone to the dogs, so they, they went out there and did their thing in the desert. And, of course, the Essenes have given us the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Essenes kept real close track on things, and they kept things accurate. So, so close that... Um, some of their rules meant things like you had to be so prepared for the Sabbath that you could not go to the bathroom on the Sabbath day. You had to prepare in advance. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how careful they things were. Things cut loose. Good. <laughs> 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 okay, so as a result, what did Jesus say to the Pharisees? Remember Matthew 23? Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law. Now, we've talked about that, haven't we? These are the scribes and the Pharisees, right? So you, you must obey and follow everything they tell you to do. Do not, however, imitate their actions because they don't practice what they preach. They're like hypocrisy, didn't it? Yeah. They tie onto the people's backs loads that are heavy and hard to carry if they aren't willing even to lift a finger to help them carry those loads. They do everything so that people will see them. Look at the straps with scripture verses on them, which they wear on their foreheads and arms, and notice how large they are. Notice also how long are the tassels on their cloaks. I uh, had the privilege of visiting Jerusalem this last summer and with, a, with a group of Adventists, and we went to the Western Wall, where the Jews is the most holy site for the Jews, and there were people, a special group of of people designated there that if you came up and said I'm a Jew and I would like to worship here oh yeah let's show you how to put these things on and they were wrapping young boys in and putting them on their heads and they were doing all that it's all right there I got moved I got pictures of it they didn't do it for any non-Jews I don't think so I don't, maybe maybe you could have gone up there and got wrapped up I didn't try it <laughs> So, you must not be called teacher because you are all members of one, and that's rabbi, you must, because you are all members of one family and have only one teacher, one, one father. And you must not call anyone here on earth father because you have only the one father in heaven, nor should you be called leader because, and so forth, and so forth. So, what was Jesus saying there in Matthew 23? Was he saying, think for yourself? Yeah, he says, read the scriptures for yourself, Think for yourself, what is, what is, what's happening here? Are we really learning about God? Or are we really learning about Pharisees? Yeah. Right? So what is the role of tradition in our religion? It should be flexible. Yes. Should well, have, the, should have a purpose. Do, are there any of the things that we do that are just for show? Not a thing. <laughs> I see. Now, traditions change over time, such as it was a tradition to have an organ in a church in the past, whereas now it's getting to be tradition to possibly have drums and guitars and stuff. So traditions can evolve, change with the culture yes. where the scriptures don't change. Right. But I mean, so tradition isn't as set as people think, is it? Tradition. Tradition, no. yeah. It, no. Tradition changes. It changes some. The interpretations mm -hmm. of Scripture have changed here and there over the millennia. You're, you're, you've got a passage here, uh, um, 
23, 13, mm -hmm. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the kingdom of heaven against men, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And you go back to Jeremiah 8, 8. <clears throat> uh, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the false pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. Yeah. The, the, the scribes well, that carry have a lot of... Here's what happened. <laughs> Let, let's be honest with what happened. False pen. Probably men from the great synagogue gradually adopted, okay, these are the things we should do. We believe this is what Scripture teaches. And I'm sure they intended for it to be that way in the beginning. And they said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay? But over time, people came to think that those directions from the scribes were just as important as what the scriptures themselves said. In some cases, as we were going to discover in a little bit, sometimes they came to think that those directions from the scribes were even more important than what the scripture said. My, 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 yes? To say that they thought they were as important as the... I think the problem is they think by doing those things they will be saved. I think that is the problem. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so Jesus came along and he cleansed the temple in John 2. And what happened? That made them mad. Two, yeah, it made them very angry. And some of them already, I mean, this is like his first Passover. Okay, I mean, it, during his ministry, in his ministry, his first ministry Passover and there were already people wanting to kill him. Okay. And it's interesting, if you read Ellen White, they said, why did we run? There was no reason for us. To, he was one person. Why did we run away? We will not do that again. He will never be able to pull that trick on us again. And what happened at the end of his ministry, just a few days before his crucifixion? He cleansed the temple. He did it again, and they ran even faster. <laughs> <laughs> when he, when Jesus got mad and did that, there must have been. Well, Jesus a wasn't mad. Oh, he wasn't mad. Well, he was. He kept. He was under upset. Control. Yes. He, he stayed under control. Yes. But there must have been an electrifying thing in yeah. something in the air that made you just want to run. Yes. But well, the kids didn't run. It was those, those the run. wrongdoers is the ones the sick, that were. The sick people didn't run. So yeah. the sin in in people ran. Yes. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Pharisees could keep the that was the yeah. real beginning. <laughs> the Pharisees could keep their 613 rules or whatever because they were sucking the temple dry. The temple yeah. taxes, the, the, you bet they had a rake off on all the livestock and stuff. They didn't have yeah. to work. Yeah. Well, so what we see here is that over time, these bits of guidance that came from these scholars came to have ever more importance, and eventually they developed a whole collection of oral tradition that came to be known by a technical name, Midrash. The Midrash, okay? Mostly oral tradition. That oral tradition was finally condensed by somebody about 200 years, well, not 200 years, less than, a, less than 100 years after Jesus was here on this earth. A gentleman by the name of Rabbi Yehuda ben, I'm sorry, Yehuda Hanasi, or Judah the Prince, put many of these ideas together, brought them down, got them in the best form they could, put them down, and he, he put them together in a form known as the Mishnah. We've talked a little bit about, we talked a little bit about the Mishnah last time, or I guess it was the time before that. <coughs> these were a collection of rules spelled out by a variety of rabbis, including some who lived at the time of Jesus. Perhaps you've heard of the names of Hillel, Shammai. Gamaliel, the grandson of Hillel, and Paul's teacher was one of those rabbis. Okay? So let's look at some specific examples. Look at Matthew 15, 1 to 6. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came from Jerusalem to, Jeru to Jesus and asked him, Now, where's Jesus ministering here? In Matthew? Remember what we said about Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Oh, Galilee? Or? Okay, this is happening in Galilee. So these Pharisees have come all the way from Jerusalem to try to catch Jesus in some misdemeanor, is what they would call it, uh, some infraction of their rules. He's, they come up there just to see if they can trap Jesus. So why is it that... And so they're watching things, and so they're... they're well, I guess we should... Well, we know. Anyway, they were walking along, and they were picking 
heads of grain, rubbing them between their hands, and eating the grains on Jesus Sabbath. Jesus and his disciples were doing that. At least his disciples were. So why is it that your disciples disobey the teaching handed down by our ancestors? They don't wash their hands in the proper way before they eat. So, what, was, what were they doing that was wrong here? They were eating the uh, wheat without washing their hands. Okay, but what, what, was, what was their great sin? They broke the tradition. Okay. Oh, is, it, is, this, is this hygiene? No, they were harvesting. It has nothing no, to do with sure. hygiene. It's not a matter of whether hands were clean or not. They, they believed that it's possible that those grains had been contaminated somehow, rather spiritually contaminated. It's possible that the hands of the disciples had touched something that contaminated it. So they believed that it was wrong to harvest, to even rub up of heads of grain in your hands and eat the grains because you might be, either the grain might be contaminated or your hands might be contaminated and you would be eating that was something that was spiritually contaminated. This has nothing to do with hygiene. What about how? harvesting on the Sabbath and threshing? Oh. Now, yeah. how did they get, how are you to get your hands spiritually clean so you oh, could touch Oh, there was an elaborate of... process that you were supposed to go through to get your hands spiritually clean. So it almost turned into magic. Yes. The whole reasoning power turned yeah. into magic. Now, let's, now let's, let's, let's be honest here now. Was Jesus saying any kind of rulemaking is out? Mm -mm. No. No, I, I like the way it is uh, toward the bottom. You've, you've made void the Word of God. Yeah. Any cr yeah. Christian religions today have kind of magic in them? Yes. Well, is there a rule in the Old Testament that tells us how to wash our hands? No. There's no rule like that. And, of course, if you want to read how they have stretched things out, look at Mark 7, starting with verse 3. For the Pharisees, as well as the rest of the Jews, follow the teaching they received from their ancestors. What do we call a teaching you receive from ancestors? Tradition. That's a tradition. They do not eat unless they wash their hands in the proper way. And nor do they eat anything that comes from the market unless they wash it first. And there's a some words in those sentences that we scholars don't even know what they mean anymore. It literally says, wash with the fist. We don't know for sure. I mean, that's one possible interpretation. Wasn't it some kind of an elaborate way that you had to wash it and then you had to hold it and let it I don't, dry off your elbows or something like yeah. that? Well, there was a yeah. very uh, intricate process about going through this. And they followed many other rules which they have received this is handed down from the fathers, the traditions, such as the proper way to wash cups, pots, copper bowls, beds. Everything had to be done exactly the way that, you know, you, and, and it got to be ridiculous. And I mean, it wasn't just the Jews that were doing this. Other people did this. It got to the place in the Middle Ages, there were the universities in, in Italy. Italy was one of, the, as far as I know, one of the first places they set up universities. They used to have long arguments about how many teeth a horse has. Now you look at me and you say, huh? What was the problem? Now we would say, as modern scientific thinking people, how do you find out how many teeth a horse has? Count them. You go and see, find a horse, open his mouth and count his teeth, right? No, the problem in their minds was that there were two different authorities and they didn't agree on how many teeth a horse has. It, it, it was almost unrelated to the fact that teeth have horse, horses have teeth and you could go and count them. The problem was there were two authorities that didn't agree. Now what do you do if there's two authorities who don't agree? You see which one's wrong. Well, that's, that's, well, they're both wrong. Wrong. that's the modern scientific way to do things. But that's not the way it was done in those days. Now, does this sound like obsessive compulsive people? Now, is just a minute, let's not be placing diagnosis on people. <laughs> <laughs> but do well, they go through tradition. these? Yeah. We're talking about tradition here. Yeah. And you're saying compulsive. I, I don't know if that quite fits. And if I, I still don't know exactly what what um, tradition is. Okay. Because because they're both handed down. Yeah. They both can be good. They both can be bad. Um, you well, know, the well, interpretations what's, what's could your, be good. What's your other thing besides tradition that you're comparing it to? Uh, scriptor, uh, solo scriptor. Okay, no. If 
if you're, if you're comparing it to Scripture, then that's not true. Because every one of us, we don't just have to receive what our parents tell us. We can go back to the Bible and we can check it for ourselves. Yeah. But that's what different. If, what if it's an interpretation of the Bible, though? That's well, and then we need to go back and say, did they interpret correctly? That's fine. Um, okay. So, but if we accept it, if we accept something that's handed down to us by the church fathers or by our literal fathers, and we don't ask any questions about it, then that becomes a tradition. Okay, this is a question for you now. This will be kind of difficult. Okay. Is circumcision, circumcision a tradition? No, because it was directly ordered in Scripture. Okay, but then Paul said that it didn't need to be done anymore. Right. So doesn't that now change it as if it was tradition? If you're a Christian. If you're a Christian. If you're a Christian. Well, aren't, you isn't a Christian the truth? Well, a Christian would say that. A Jew wouldn't say that because he sticks with the Old Testament, so he continues to be circumcised according to the directions of the Old Testament. If you're a Christian, now we have the additional guidance from the New Testament, and we would say, based on the fact that Christ came and fulfilled those requirements, we would say, okay, the Christian guidance now is, you don't need to do that. But you're not, you're not, no, you're not circumcised. Like a tradition. Okay. It, it does the same thing. You, you are not circumcised to prove your relationship right. to Abraham. Right. Well, well that's, that's good, but now they were doing circumcision. Now they're not. So it's almost like, it's almost like there was a tradition that was changed or done away yeah, with. In some respects, yes. So Jim I'm read, still a little confused. Jim read the quote, tradition is a false pen. Scripture no, is... Did the, the scribes write with a false pen, didn't they? I'm not yeah. Surprised. And so what's written with a false pen would be more tradition. Although I was reading through uh, um, Matthew 23. Man, he just cutting those scribes and Pharisees uh, back and forth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, well look, at, look at one of the places he quotes. It's found in Isaiah 29, verse 13. Yeah, no, many good words. The Lord said, These people claim to worship me. They claim to worship me, but their words are meaningless and their hearts are somewhere else. Their religion is nothing but human rules and traditions which they have simply memorized. I don't know how you could say it any clearer okay. than that. Yeah. And, and, and much of their motivation is to place themselves above everybody else. Yes. And they were doing it as a legalism. Yes. As, as a, well, as they, were, they were doing it to be seen of men. Sure. They were doing it, to, let the world watch me, I'm a saint. Status. Mm -hmm. So let me read this once more. The Lord said, these people claim to worship me. Now what would true worship be? It would be <coughs> careful Bible study, prayer, Try to follow God's word, okay? But their words are meaningless and their hearts are somewhere else. Their religion is nothing but human rules and traditions which they have simply memorized, okay? Isn't there a parallel that goes with that um, in uh, when uh, this world ends and we go uh, and Jesus says, I never knew you? Yes. And that is because you were following your rules and traditions and you were not following what I said in Scripture. Yep. So, I mean, the world does, seems like we still do it. Desire of Ages by Ellen White, pages 398, paragraphs 3 and 4, puts it this way. The substitution of the precepts of men for the commandments of God has not ceased. Even among Christians are found institutions and usages that have no better foundation than the traditions of the fathers. Such institutions resting upon mere human authority have supplanted those of divine appointment. Men cling to their traditions and revere their customs and cherish hatred against those who seek to show them their error. In place of the authority of the so-called fathers of the church, God bids us accept the word of the eternal father the Lord of heaven and earth. Is that pretty clear? So, uh, the idea that only a pastor can baptize somebody, okay. is that a tradition? Uh, that's a, 
I suppose in, in yeah, one yeah. sense it's tradition because it's a, it's a way that we have chosen to use to allow someone into our group. Now, as a, as a legal group that has a legal standing, we have to have certain guidelines for who's in and who's out. And so we have chosen to use that guideline. But well, you, there was a time when you worked in the bush. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a time when there was somebody who wanted to be baptized and there wasn't a pastor around? Yes. Well, I'll tell you. And what did you do done. about that? You wait till a circuit pastor comes by? Yes. Or? Mm -hmm. I had people I worked with. Uh, I remember one pastor had 23 churches. How often do you think he came by? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I think if a person wanted to be baptized, they shouldn't have to wait. Yeah. Well, several months. You know, my parents weren't really Christians, and my mom, and she came to know who God was after coming to Loma Linda, and she wanted to be baptized. And my dad really didn't want to go to a church, and he says, I'll dunk you in the tub. <laughs> and he did. And she said, no. And she went to a church and was baptized. Uh -huh. So I think baptism means more when yeah. it comes from... It's a public... The baptism was chosen of course, Jesus chose it, and this, I, once again, I would say that I had the privilege this last summer to going to the actual place where Jesus, or at least very, very close to the actual place where Jesus was, was baptized by John, and they have just dug up some of those archaeological things in the last couple of years. Wow. So that's, that's very interesting. It was a privilege. What country is it? It's this, this would be on the other side of Jordan, so that's of the, of the Jordan River, and that's in the country of Jordan. So the, the value of this seems to have um, a great deal to do with human psyche. Yes. Yes. It, that, that seems to bear an awful lot of, uh, mm -hmm. an awful lot of, uh, I, I, I want to be baptized well, in a church rather than my bathtub. Okay, well, hold on a bit a minute. <laughs> the, the point of being baptized, since we're talking about that, is to proclaim that you want to be a part of the group. Okay. Do you do that in your bathroom? Or do you do that in front of the group? You do that in front of the group. That's the whole point. You're saying, well, I declare myself, I want to be a part of you. Not necessarily a part of the group. You want to be a part of God. Well, but that's the group. And you, you I mean, we, we, I think most all of us here are members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We, we choose to, to belong to that group. We don't think we're, we don't think the Adventist Church is perfect. If we, if the Adventist Church were perfect, we would be in heaven by now. Well, I kind of disagree with how the Adventist Church says if you're baptized here, you have to be a member here. I know this uh, pastor who will give a funeral to everyone and then he'll baptize uh, anyone. He's a Nazarene. And I think that's wonderful. If a person wants to be baptized, he will baptize them and not require them to be a Nazarene. Maybe I'm wrong in that. Well, I mean, I, let's not go into those technical details. I, oh, I don't okay. think that's something we need to do part of our Sabbath school lesson. But Christ gave us an example. If for no other reason, there's some relevance to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we need to look at a couple other passages before we run out of time. Uh, I'd like to look at Romans chapter 10, the first four verses. And this is, gives you a little idea about something. See what you learned from this. My brothers and sisters, now this is Paul writing to his friends in Corinth, right? I'm sorry, writing, writing to his, his friends in Rome, to the, Christ, the church in Rome. How I wish with all my heart that my own people might, I'm sorry, and I'm looking at the wrong place. I want to go to 1 Corinthians 10. Hmm. <clears throat> well, no, I'm sorry, I do want Romans 10. I'm sorry, back, let's go back there again. Yeah. Um, I can assure you that they are deeply devoted to God, my own people, but their devotion is not based on true knowledge. They have not known the way in which God puts people right with himself, and instead they have tried to set up their own way. Now, what is their own way? Following the traditions of their people, right? And so they did not submit themselves to God's law of putting people right. For Christ has brought the law to an end, so that everyone who believes is put right with God. Okay? Now that's my Good News Bible. I like the way J.B. Phillips has translated that. He said, For Christ, think about this, what this implies about ritual and tradition. For Christ means the end of 
the struggle for righteousness by the law for everyone who believes in him. In other words, they thought they were earning salvation by doing all those rituals, all those little details they were doing. And God said, no, that's not the way you earn salvation. Well, it's already questions already been asked. Are there, are there, do we have any rules that maybe need to be changed? Customs or traditions. Ellen White said this, let all who accept human authority, the customs of the church, or the traditions of the fathers take heed to the warning conveyed in the words of Christ. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Wow. What should we do with that? Is it plain enough? Do we have a clear sense of which rules are God's, God and Scripture based and which rules are merely human ideas? Here's another quotation from Ellen White. This is Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 125. Believers have not infrequently allowed the enemy to work through them at the very time when they should have been wholly consecrated to God and to the advancement of his work. Unconsciously, they have wandered far from the way of righteousness, cherishing a spirit of criticism and fault-finding, a pharisaical piety and pride. They have grieved away the Spirit of God and have greatly retarded the work of God's messengers. Do you think there's any of us not so much right around this table. I'm not asking you, any of you to confess here. Uh, do you think we, the church has ever wandered away from God's ideal? Certainly no biblical history of that. <laughs> Was that talking about the church or individuals? It's talking about individuals and the church. Yeah. It's a, actually, it's kind of a constant problem. Yes, it is. Well, Jesus was trying to stip, strip away the the traditions and the whatever, and he says, let's try to see what God actually says. What did God really want us to do? Do we understand the meaning? Do we understand why we're doing this? Do we understand why? He kept asking, why, 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 why? Do we understand the meaning? And Ellen White said many times, you've got to understand the meaning. Do our Sabbath school classes, do our sermons in our churches, focusing on getting the people in the pew to study and find out what is the meaning. What are, we, what are we really doing? Why are we worshiping? Why are we doing this? Now, I hope that you don't have any problem with that with your, in your church, but ask some questions. Think about it. Start a discussion. See you next week.